So in Matthew 25, we're looking at a parable that you've probably heard before, all going within our vision series that we've been going through. And just to remind you again, our vision is we want to see all people walking together with God, bearing fruit for his kingdom, and continue to look at this idea of fruitfulness. And what I think we see in the Matthew 25 passage here is there is an expectation from God that we are faithful. Um, We do not own the things that we have. We are stewards of the things that we have. God has given us what we have. He's given us our money, our time, our talent, as they say, time, talent, treasure, those three T's. And we're expected to steward it. Now, in the context of all this, I want to be very clear that um, it's, it's clear from Scripture, and we've seen already in John 15, Galatians 5, this idea that God's the one that actually causes the fruit. Um, you see Paul say a similar kind of thing where he says, I planted, and he's talking about evangelizing to the Corinthians, Apollos, another preacher, watered, and he says, but God gave the increase. God's the one that makes it happen. In other words, a farmer can do the work of spreading the seeds, um, prepping the ground, doing all those things. But it's God that causes the growth to actually happen. It's God that causes the fruit to come. Uh, in the metaphor illustration, in terms of our hearts, in terms of the work that happens spiritually, we're to take action. Uh, we can't be judged by our fruits, but I think we can judge our actions and the, and the tasks that we take. So here's the way I answer this question. How do I bear fruit for his kingdom? I use what God has entrusted to build his kingdom. God's entrusted things to me, and there's an expectation that I use it for his kingdom. Now, I want to note, I'm not going to read the entire passage in this video. I'll let you guys do that. But right at the very beginning, he says, For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. Now, the it there is important. For it will be like. He's, this is in the context of a whole discussion and a series of, of illustrations he's using to dis- describe the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And uh, so this is another way to describe it. It's like the thing I'm about to share with you. Now, there is also a a part of it that you might be thinking, man, is God really like that? Is God this kind of harsh person that uh, takes from things that he didn't earn, he didn't work at, you know, which is the way the one of the guys talks about God? And I think it's important to realize that when Jesus uses these parables, not every aspect of it is meant to describe who God is. He's helping us to illustrate, to understand and to to be illustrated of of a principle. And we have three servants, each of them given various amounts of of talents. And a talent was a amount of money, a significant amount of money. It was about the equivalent of 20 years labor, the wages of a labor, 20 years. So it's a significant amount of money that's given to each of these servants. And and note well, too, that he, he says that they're each given according to their ability. So the master here says, okay, this guy can handle five, this guy can handle two, and this guy can handle one. And it says that they, the, the guy with five, it says he immediately, right away, he went out. And he started using that five to, to multiply that five, to go from five, he turned it into another five. So now he has 10. The guy with two, same story, two became four. But the guy who was the one, he buries it. And then when the master returns, the master's response to him is another thing where it seems, man, is this, is this a little harsh? And I just want to highlight the very last verse. And because the master says to him, cast the worthless servant into outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, you might be thinking, man, that seems really harsh. And you might be thinking, so if I am not faithful with what God's given me, if I fail in some way, is this what's going to happen to me? Do I lose my salvation? Am I put out into this outer darkness where I can't be with God and his light? And I think it's really important to take this passage in the similar kind of way that we would take other passages about the law. In other words, God has a holy standard. God told Israel, he said, don't be kind of good. He said, be holy as I am holy. 
God's righteous standard doesn't get minimized just because you did your best. God does not grade on a curve. Well, uh, most people failed at this, so that means I'm going to give a passing grade. What was a C now becomes an A. And if you got a D, then now it's a B. If you got an F, then now it's a C. That's not the way God's righteousness and holiness works. It is a perfect standard. It's the bad news of the gospel that helps us to realize that, okay, I need a savior. I need someone to stand in for me because I have failed. And, and I think what we're seeing from this passage is that it is wicked to do evil things, but it is also wicked to fail to do what's right. To fail to do what's right is also wicked and evil. And that's the judgment that comes down for the sin of omission, if you will. So don't think, oh, wow. Okay, let's, let's try to, there's two things I think we need to avoid here is like, don't think, okay, I'm not perfect. So therefore, I, this is not for me and I can't be a follow God. And also don't make the other mistake of, well, uh, you know, I'm doing better than average, so I'm okay. That's not the way the law works. The law sets a, a, a immovable standard that no person can get over because every single person has failed. Every single person has sinned. That's why we turn to Jesus, the perfect person who stands in our place. So again, God doesn't grade on a curve. He gives us his righteousness and then judgment and justice is given out to Jesus on the cross. But I think the takeaway from here is to really understand that, okay, God has an expectation of faithfulness. God has an expectation that I uh, don't sit on what God's given me or bury what God's given me. He's, he's, said, he's expecting you to be a steward of it. Take what I've given you, he says, and use it to build my kingdom. Don't be passive. Don't be lazy. Don't give in to fear in such a way that you're paralyzed and you can't take action. But take what God's given and use it for his kingdom. Knowing that I'm not going to be, the standard isn't fruitfulness, the standard is faithfulness. That's the expectation of God. Taking what God has given me and beginning to use it for his kingdom. And being, again, reminded that I don't pick my assignment I don't pick and decide what my fruitfulness is going to look like. That's God's job. But I just take action with what he's given me, not avoiding, not being lazy, not giving into fear, but trusting him and being obedient to him, knowing that he's given me certain things based on my ability so that I can be faithful to him. And then notice, too, that his, his commendation to the man with five and the man with two was identical. God says, well done, good and faithful servant. So it's not about the numbers. It's not about the output. It's about faithfulness to what he's doing. But again, remembering that Jesus is the one that stands in for me. And I'm not going to minimize my failure. I'm going to give my failure to my Savior at the cross. And know that, yes, my sins of omission are sin, but that sin is on that cross and his righteousness is on me. And I love this, this quote by Tim Keller. I think that it says it really well. He says, religion is, I obey, therefore I am accepted. Gospel is, I'm accepted, therefore I obey. Do I work my way to the mountaintop to finally earn my way to God? Or does God come down from the mountain, take me to him, and then say, hey, you're my son now. You're free to serve me and you're free to follow me. And we do that in response to the love that he's already shown me. I don't earn that. He's given that to me. And now I've got the joy, as he talks about in this passage, of following him and serving him with what he's given me.